Yo, yo, we're back, uh, and we're going to pick up where we left off with Porn is War. And last time we did this topic, it was a very hot topic, a lot of views on this video. Uh, but unfortunately, we got cut off, and both Will and Tim uh, had internet issues, got cut off, didn't really get to share what we wanted to share in terms of uh, the history of porn being used as war, uh, lust being used as war, as a, we as a weapon against men. And uh, before we jump in, this is going to be great because we're going to talk about how men today also, we're going to talk about how men today uh, are being, it, it, it's hurting us. It's hurting our society. It's hurting the family. It's hurting our physiology, our psychology. And it's, they're kind of winning in a way. And so we got to be aware of this war. We got to be aware of the history of the war. And then we got to be aware of how we can confront this war. But I have to bring up that the first time I became aware of the fact that porn is a weapon, uh, literally, not, not like I'm making this up or it's a cool thing to say. It's like, no, it actually is a weapon, was when I came across E. Michael Jones's Libido Dominandi. And so before the show started, I, I figured I'd look up some of what he's just at least put online. He's one of the most censored guys around. And I found this tweet I just wanted to share with you guys. Uh, this is sort of like modern day warfare. He's talking about uh, Israel broadcasting porn in Ramallah. Uh, I guess this was 2020 he posted this. It may have been just a few years earlier. Uh, he asked, was, it, oh, was pornography freedom or was it a weapon? Pornography is a weapon of psychological warfare. Is it not freedom? And we kind of like have it shoved down our throat as if it's freedom. It's sexual freedom, sexual license. I get to do what I want. Uh, and then he just goes on to propose, do not look at porn. It is a weapon. Sexual liberation is a form of political control. And that's the subtitle of his book, Sexual Liberation as Political Control. So there we have it from the guy that uh, introduced that topic to me. Will, how you doing today, brother? Doing well, Elliot. Good to see you. Excited to d dive into this with you because I know that you were really amped to share some biblical context to this conversation of porn being war. And, uh, and you mentioned something from the book of Numbers. I'd love for you to share that with our audience. Um, you know, this is not a new thing. Porn and lust has been used as a weapon against men from uh, the Genesis, right? And so let's, let's, I'd love to hear you dive into that. Yeah, so I'm going through the Old Testament at the moment with my teenage kids. And I came across this passage in Numbers 25, verse one to three. I'll read it out to you because it really struck me as being a very powerful example of how men can be undermined by lust and how it can be weaponized. Very much similar to what you're describing from EMJ there. It's not porn, strictly speaking, in, it's not just in media, it's just real life using sex as a weapon in war. Check this out. And Israel at that time abode in Sethim, and the people committed fornication with the daughters of Moab, who called them to their sacrifices, and they ate of them and adored their gods. And Israel was initiated to Bil Figor. So I looked up what's happening here, and you've got this guy called Balak, who's the king of the Moabites, and he hires Balaam, who is a wicked prophet, to curse Israel. And Balak has been seeing the progress of Israel. He's worried it's becoming strong and he wants to try and do something to stop them. That's what the curse is about. Now, Balaam takes the money, but he's unable to curse Israel because God does not let him do that. But what he does do instead, he can't curse them. He gets thousands of prostitutes and he sends them into the Israelite camp in the place of the curse because his plan is if he can use the women to seduce the Israelite soldiers into idol worship, then God himself would curse them instead. So he can't curse them directly, but he wants to tempt them into idol worship. And this is the way he does it. So these Moabite and Midianite women show up on his command at the Israeli encampment. And then the Israelite men start having regular sex with them. They are then invited by the women to join in with the pagan religious sacrifices. They go with them 
they eat the sacrificial meal, and then before long, they're bowing down to the pagan gods. And then also, there are like fertility rites associated with this too, sacred sex rites. And this is the idol Baal Pure. So then we're told that some kind of critical mass of the people are yoked to this idol. And long story short, this is only stopped after 24,000 Israelites were killed. So a large group, probably most of the Israelite leadership, are ordered by God to be executed. So you can see what a powerful hold lust fornication with the heathen women has over the men. And the reason this really jumped out at me was that I know St. Augustine describes lust as being an idol and how it can so easily lead to unbelief. And Aquinas as well talks about blindness of mind being one of the first daughters of lust. So if you can get a guy mired in lust, in sexual depravity, then it darkens his intellect and it weakens his willpower. And that's what we see so much of with porn, right? I mean, that's the sexual revolution in a nutshell. We know that feminists were promoting promiscuity to try to undermine the family, especially the male role within it. And I think of this as being a bit like, if you wanted to control a really big, powerful bull in the field, you're the farmer, you've got to find that pressure point. You get the, the ring through the nose, and you can lead it wherever you want. Same kind of... ...all of them there, then you can lead them wherever you want. Hang out one second. Are, are, are we echoing? Somebody's mentioning that there's an echo in the, uh, in the chat. I don't, I don't hear an echo. I don't hear an echo, but Will just dropped out for me the last five seconds of what he said. Yeah, that was me trying to fix it. Uh, just let oh. us know in the comment there uh, if we're echoing, because I just want to make sure that this is sounding good. Um, Will, sorry about that, man. Could you just mention the last piece that you said? Yeah, so when you were talking about EMJ saying that sexual liberation is political control, I was likening that to this story of Moses and the, the Moabite women. If you can use lust as the tactic to control men, then you can lead them wherever you want. It's like putting a ring through the nose of a bull. You've got control of this really powerful drive, probably the most powerful one that men have, and the easiest way to lead them astray. So we know that feminists wanted to promote promiscuity to undermine monogamy, and destroy patriarchy through that. It's interesting that, uh, you know, it leads to idol worship. I see today that, well, number one, men worship women. They say putting the puss on the pedestal. And it's definitely a thing that you see. Uh, I even remember being a young man when I, lust started raising into my body. I started plastering my walls with pictures of women that would, you know, today, of course, I have icons and crosses on my wall, but it was literally like, you know, uh, they were icons of my God woman but then it goes a little bit further i guess as a man gets older you know in the bible it shows that they're worshiping these gods but then a man spends the rest of his life trying to make money as a means for getting puss and so it becomes it, we go from false god to false god what you're saying makes so much sense this lust takes us away from the true god focuses us on the material god which becomes our mother in the matrix and then we spend the rest of our lives chasing money so that we can get more of that <laughs> lustful god that we're after man yeah exactly you, you just reminded me um father gabriel amorth he was the chief exorcist at rome and he wrote a book about his experiences and he's said that the most frequent weak points in man are from time to time always the same pride money and lust so linking money and lust there together elliot like most guys want to get six figure salaries so they can get more sex right the money's really about the sex ultimately that's the big motivator absolutely tim you had some really interesting research that you uh unfolded as well in terms of um you know, what the church says about pornography and, and lust. 
Uh, would you be willing to share that? Yeah, of course. On the general heading, I think we have to set the table thus. Christianity, you, you don't want to underestimate how sui generis, how absolutely revolutionary and unique Christian matrimony was. It was a new invention as against the Jews, as against the Gentiles, right? We, people who follow EMJ would, would uh, probably be, be pleased to hear me say Christian matrimony is a unique world-beating institution. Uh, the idea of true Christian mono true monogamy is uniquely Christian. And the Catechism of the Council of Trent makes this clear. Our version of marriage was absolutely unique. A woman could not be given away in marriage against her consent. And once that consent was taken from man and woman in Christian marriage, this was not the case in Jewish or Gentile relations, man was truly expected to be monogamous and, and to follow Christ's admonition that when a woman sees uh, when a man looks at a woman lustfully in his heart, he's already committed adultery with her. That is the highest bar. And here's the thing. You guys are both like strength coach. Uh, you're a strength coach, Elliot. You're both bodybuilders. You're all about the challenge on the body. This is the highest that the world's ever known, the Christian standard on marriage. And the Roman Catechism makes this really stark. I had my friend Anthony Abate on my show yesterday, and we were talking about some of the ancient pre-Christian sex cults, se uh, cults at Ephesus, and the fact that we're now reinstantiating with uh, Drag Queen Story Hour, what they had there. there. There were men priests, male priests, who would castrate themselves, and they'd put on performances, and women at Ephesus would bring their kids to come watch it. So it's literally a demonic sex cult that's being revisited. And I was just sitting there thinking and I was dialoguing subsequently with Anthony. Why is all the demonic Baal worshiping activity always associated with sex? Why does everything come down to sex for the humans? And it's because it is the life creating activity. You harness it the way Christianity did in a way that's sui generis and you beat all the world. You conquer all the world. If like Paul the Sixth, you take off the papal tiara and say, no, we're no longer going to try to beat the world, Christianity, with our new Christian modesty, chastity, then it will take back over the church and you will see the re return of all the cults, which is what we've seen in the last 50 years, particularly the last 10. So that's the backdrop that Christian matrimony which requires men not to look at porn, not to even look at a woman, a fully clothed woman with lust in his heart, is the highest standard, and it is the highest standard of manliness. And all the world was subdued to Christianity because of its sexual standard. That's what I would, I would say. Um, so there's this section in the Catechism called Advantages of Indissolubility, and it distinguishes why, unlike the Jews, the Christians, unlike, uh, uh, will allow divorce in no circumstances, even in the case, uh, the rare case of female wifely infidelity, which usually infidelity is male. Most divorces are instituted by the woman, but most infidelity in marriage is male. Uh, it, here's, here's what I wanted to show you, particularly at the end. The pastor should not hear a omit this salutary admonition of St. Augustine, who, to convince the faithful that they should not consider it a hardship to receive back the wife that they've put away for adultery, provided she repents of her crime, observes, why should not a Christian husband receive back his wife when the church receives her? And why should not the wife pardon her adulterous but penitent husband when Christ has already pardoned him? True it is that Scripture calls foolish who keepeth an adulteress, but the meaning refers to her who refuses to repent of her crime and quit the disgraceful course she has entered on. From all this, it will be clear that Christian marriage is far superior in dignity and perfection to that of the Gentiles and the Jews, the pre-Christian Gentiles and Jews. So I just want people to ruminate here on our context of porn. Porn is the devil's sneak 
into otherwise monogamous Christian marriages that are monogamous Christian marriage in the laity beat him. It was a trump card. And porn, like 98% of all even Christian men have looked at it once in the last six months. Not, not me, not you guys, but 98% of Christian males have. It's the devil's way to trump the trump card. Just dig that. Consider how world-beating Christian matrimony is because of the high, high standards. It makes men lean, hard, tough, hungry. Yeah, there you have it. Huh. Yeah. Will, anything to add to that? Tim, I think there's a bit in the Trent Catechism as well, saying that um, the man who uses his wife like a concubine is doing something terrible so even within marriage chastity is still a requirement so at no point do you just completely unleash lust there's this weird idea and you can see it coming in some of the comments in the chat here as well that monogamy is basically just putting one woman on a pedestal and we're worshiping women and lust still has control of us within monogamous marriage but chastity within marriage means no you're still in control and the point of marriage ultimately is for children that's the main end of it so when you're earning money when you're providing it's not just all for the woman it's for the family so the woman is secondary to the fact that we have the main point of marriage being children procreation i had a conversation yeah. go ahead tim sorry i was just gonna say yeah if people really don't understand the platonic formality of uh the marital act which is sex it, it has to be uh open to life right it's got to be procreative and unitive and this centers on its goal or telos which is Procreation. That doesn't mean every single act of marital coitus has to conduce to life. That would be uh, absurd. But every single act has to center on the goal of sex. You have to non, you have to not deteologize it, take away its goal, and you do that by making sure that every act has these three fonts. It's got to be marital, got to be uh, unitive, and it's got to be procreative. And if you do that, as every married Catholic man knows who's faithful. You're not going to be obsessing about it because as the woman's cycle flows through the month, unless you're trying to have a kid, there will be natural periods of uh, continence. And this makes you strong. It makes it easy to go through even a, maybe the last trimester of pregnancy or something like that. where you're like, man, this was hard when I was first married. This is a lot less hard now. So that's just flat wrong. Continence makes men strong. Sorry, Elliot. Go ahead. No, that was that was helpful. Um, you know, just reading some of the comments, and I'm you know wanted to address what some of the guys are asking. What about? So we're talking about pornography, and of course that leads to lust. It leads to uh, infidelity. It leads to a lot of different things. But what about masturbation itself? We don't. We haven't really addressed that. Is masturbation in marriage uh, infidelity? And you know. Why is it that the church tells us that masturbation is a bad idea? Well, that, my previous answer stands as a kind of uh, prescriptive to what you just asked, because mm -hmm. every single sexual act has to be unitive, procreative, in, in marital. Um, the, the two main fonts, once we've established that the woman who is the man's sex partner, the husband's sex partner, is the wife, then you just, it's got to be unitive and it's got to be procreative. That means the, the place of ejaculation is, the, you know, the, the place where it would be unitive and procreative. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that guarantees that it has to be, it can't be test tube baby sex, which is just, masturbation is just test tube baby sex right um that's because that for the thing to be what it is you have to treat it as what it is all right we, we have to treat let's let's go back to the old 
analogy of the digestive system. That's like saying, can you use your digestive system as a pleasure center? Well, principle of double effect, if you fast for a day, which is really healthy, and then have a, a big feast, feast at the end of a fast, which is highly advisable and, and very Christian, you should have stuff that's somewhat good for you. But are you going to enjoy it? Yes. But if all you do is sit around on your couch and eat potato chips and get fat and disgusting, it's bad for your body as it's bad for your soul. So you're abusing your digestive system for pleasure alone. That's the equivalent of masturbation. And most of these guys on here won't question the digestive system. They question the reproductive system because they don't know that for the reproductive system to be what it is, in the male case, it's got to be unitive, procreative, and marital. Yeah, Will, what exactly. are your thoughts on, uh, what do you say to a guy who says that, um, you know, it's normal and natural, we got to blow our load, uh, and it's healthy for you. They've got uh, all kinds of copes, like it's good for your prostate. Um, what do you say to a guy like that? The reason you have your sex drive is as a prompt, it's an urge to get you to get married and have a family. If you think about what this is all directed to, what the purpose of an erection is, why sperm is the way it is, what the goal of it is all leading to, even from just kissing a girl and first getting aroused, one thing leads to the next. and it's about trying to bring the whole sexual act to its fulfillment in children in the context of marriage and the family. Now, if you are masturbating, then you are severing that process, the sexual pleasure from what its point is. And at that point, you're just trying to get pleasure without responsibility. And you are turning it all in on yourself, whereas it should be a self sacrificial thing that finds its fulfillment in marriage. And if you think about it, once you've accepted masturbation, contraception, all these things that reduce sexual pleasure to just sterile friction for fun, these are all the thin end of the wedge that once admitted means you have no argument against homosexuality, for example. Because if we don't care about procreation in principle, if we're happy to act in a way that's contrary to natural law, then all of that comes with it. So guys who think that it's masculine to masturbate, ironically, you are in principle agreeing with the homosexuals about sex. And you probably wouldn't want to say that that's masculine, but you've got no argument against them. So there was a, a video that was going around this week on Instagram that I saw. Uh, it had Dennis Prager, who positions himself as a conservative, and I think uh, Shapiro also. Uh, and Joseph Rieske is asking that we, we discuss that for a moment. And uh, I did see it, and he mentions that in the case of a marriage where a man is sexually frustrated, uh, rather than him cheating on his wife, having sex outside of the marriage, he proposes that porn is a good thing because it helps the marriage stay together. Uh, is that what kind? Is that good logic? Does that make sense? It might keep the marriage together. Um, he's not having sex outside of the marriage. In that case, is porn useful? No, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say no. I'm pretty sure that porn use, um, apart from the woman out earning the man, is one of the things that is most highly correlated with divorce. If you look at what the divorce lawyers talk about, porn is right up there. And this is because it is likely to lead to infidelity in the flesh because a man is giving himself over to all these lustful thoughts and what starts as just thought and fantasy progresses to action, texting maybe, meeting up with someone. You've also got all the different physiological effects of porn because of the way that it affects the brain. And you can get decreased arousal for your wife and in many cases wind up impotent as well. So the idea that it's going to help a marriage, that makes no sense considering that data that we've got on 
porn correlated with impotency and with divorce as well. But also, what kind of pathetic guy is this that he can't control his own lust? Right. It's such a low bar. Yet, yeah, uh, in the same video, Prager defended the idea of cartoon child porn. At least, I, I don't know if either of you guys knew that, <laughs> at least insofar as he thought, look, it's, it's, not, it's not a lovely concept, he thought he said, but there's no one getting hurt because it's cartoon. And Matt Frad's like, this, this is evil. This, this is evil. We're talking about the Matt Frad interview, right? Uh, I just caught a, a meme. It was just a snippet, so I didn't even know who he was talking to. Yeah, this blew up like a month ago. When he went on Matt Frad's show and they had a debate, Matt Frad okay. usually moderates debates on on pornography. Prager was defending it, Matt was attacking it, and there was this section where he he literally defends cartoon child porn as a, he w he doesn't even call it a lesser evil. He uses the language of consequentialism, wherein you defend an evil. Uh, if it's as long as it's the lesser of two evils, you know, this is obviously philosophically bankrupt consequentialism. You may not do evil so that good may arise. But um, he never even calls it an evil. He said, no, these are thoughts. Uh, you know, in, I think he says in Judaism, thoughts are always different from acts. Instead of, of course, Augustine has the concept of a verbal thought. Jesus backs this up when he says, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery. That's an act. Um, and we know that we freely engage in thoughts. If, you're, if you see a beautiful woman on the street as a married man or really, really any man who's not her husband, you should be like, I'm, I'm going to block that out. I'm going to think of something else. And this is what we're, this is where continence begins. But um, it was really a it was really a disgusting display. And uh, I know True News Rick Wiles was calling for the broadcaster conservative broadcasters convention which took place last week in your neck of the woods elliot to to ban uh christian broadcasters to brand ban dennis prager for his strong strong unrelenting defenses of porn for you know an hour and a half two hours on matt frad show he had the chance to think better of it, and he just kept saying look we're not like christians in this way uh hmm. you're allowed to do this so so not only on the question of divorce and some other sexual ethics, but on porn, Judaism is, as a matter of fact, at least the, the, the popular version of it represented by Prager, is much more like the world than like Christianity. Christianity is the city on the hill with the high standard. Judaism is more, more like the Gentiles in this way, pre-Christian Gentiles. So we, we're getting a lot of great questions, and I'm happy this uh, that that's the fact, guys. So keep sending them. We got one here from 613 Trap Man. Uh, he wants us to talk about the benefits, in quotes, of porn for the 60% of men who won't procreate. And I, I, I kind of get where he's coming from, not in terms of the benefits of porn, but what about those guys who will never procreate, that a woman will never be interested in them there's a lot of them what do you say to those guys sexually frustrated men first up i would say that a lot of these guys who think of themselves as incels really aren't turns out that just the hard fact of the matter is that half of guys are below average if we're using these crude kind of metrics that dating apps would rank people by just mathematically the way averages work if you're below average height below average salary all the rest of it then you turn out by those metrics to be below average man and mathematically that's half of people and those guys don't want to accept a woman who is matched with them according to what the biologists call assortative pairing which is what monogamy is all about so you get some 6'2", six, 6'3", six, stud who's got a six-figure salary, all the rest of it, and he's going to get a corresponding woman, 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10, and then we go down the list, and the fives pair off with the fives, the fours pair off with the fours, etc. Trouble is, a lot of these guys who think they're incels are four or five out of guys who want seven or eight out of ten girls, and when they are presented with the kind of women that maybe they 
would get married to if they were willing to, they'd turn their noses up at them. So I think saying that 60% of men have got no chance of getting married or reproducing, that's really highballing the number. If we look back historically at what happens in monogamous societies, they are successful because they can integrate most men into marriages. That's the whole reason why monogamy beats multiple wives, because multiple wives leaves too many men who aren't integrated into families, and they cause a lot of social instability because they've got nowhere for all that energy to go. They're more likely to rape, pillage, rob, etc. So the most stable societies are the monogamous ones. Now, let's say that you really have tried um, and the women who are matched to you still aren't interested in you. It's not long ago that the most masculine men in the Christian West were actually lifelong virgins. And that was the highest calling. So the celibacy of the knights, for example, the guys who you would look up to as being the most alpha, the cream of the crop, they had a higher purpose, a higher calling than family life. So there's nothing shameful about being a lifelong virgin. Some of the greatest men who've lived have done that. Christ was lifelong virgin. And you might be called to that. Celibacy is going to be a tough thing and you can't achieve it without God's help. But the idea that the knights would have needed to masturbate to relieve themselves or get some kind of health benefit from it, that's just comical. And it makes a mockery of the whole idea of being a strong man who's in control of your urges. Tim? Yeah, I agree. I agree a thousand percent. I, I just... I, I'm not trying to be redundant, but I think it's really important that we recontextualize everything Will just said and, mm -hmm. and um, yours and my preceding statements back in the, the, the grounding principle that doing what's difficult for the body is almost always good for it. Now, this doesn't mean cutting yourself or something like that, but within the bounds of competency doing what's on the outer bounds of your body's competency is good for it. That's what you guys are all about is uh, weightlifters, right? That's what, when I, when I lift weights in my garage, I'm trying to push the fringes, trying to tear extra muscle fiber, a little bit extra each time if possible. Well, this is the case with, with fasting, with diet. You know, you want as much protein as you can get in as few calorie whatever whatever i'm going to trigger the dietitians in the audience but that you you get the point what's doing what's in your body's natural competency at higher levels is good for it why does this break down for the red pill set when it comes to sexual continence it is absolutely natural and in keeping with what we're built to do with what the procreative system is built to do. And there's one worldview under the sun that even, even among the other two of three monotheisms, Islam and Judaism, they don't, as we, we cited with Dennis Prager, they are not with us on this. There is one worldview that is consistent with what is best for the procreative system and, and the natural needs of the body and the way that it builds continents like a muscle is built by challenging it, by pushing back resistance training of the procreative system. It's just a fact. And it's, I, I don't get why it's not catching more. Right. Go ahead, Will. Yeah. Interesting. You mentioned Islam there, Tim, because it's got a similar problem to Protestantism in a way in that there's no magisterium, there's no official teaching body when you can just find out what is the stance on contraception. You can go to some Islamic scholars and be told, yeah, contraception, great, we've got no problem with it at all. We've got no problem with anal sex either. And once you've admitted that into your worldview, it's very difficult for you to actually fight back against degenerate modern sexual culture because you share the same kind of premises. And so we've got Prager on the one hand saying porn can be healthy. We've got Islam allowing contraception. We've got 
divorce allowed as well. Right. So it's Christianity that is making the strongest stand against the direction that the modern world is going in. And if you look at what happened when Rome fell, the Christians just kept sticking to their high standards of monogamous marriage, especially the high standards placed on men, and forged ahead while everything fell apart around them. And we've seen that work in history before, and it can work again now if guys are strong enough to commit to it. Now, you guys are 100% answering this question, but I want to ask it anyway because uh, he's constantly peppering us with questions. Think outside the container. I appreciate you. Uh, you know, these are questions that men ask. I think my guests have answered them, but just to be a bit more poignant, uh, he says, aside from appealing to God the Father, what exactly is the argument for why men should be held to the same standard of chastity as women? That's easy. The natural, Wait. the natural law, the, yeah. the natural law, mm -hmm. knowable by your natural reason. We, I just, I just made the uh, teleological argument from from design. Mm -hmm. What's best for your body? What is the purpose of the procreative system? It's to procreate. What's the purpose of your digestive system? Is it to digest? Is it to break down and metabolize uh, proper, efficient calories? Yeah. What are you, dude, are you citing scripture from, from either Christianity or some other religion to ask what is the purpose of your metabolic system? It's to metabolize. Right. What's the purpose of the procreative system? It's to procreate. I'm, I'm, I'm not a scripture scholar. Right. I'm, a, I'm a philosopher. We make arguments a priori lots of times. And this is an a priori argument. A priori means you make it from the ground up. You need someone to break down for you that <laughs> the procreative system is geared toward procreating. Have you ever seen the Brookings Institute, which I think it's yearly, prints statistics new statistics updated ones on what happens when people try to procreate outside a family the way the communists like do you do you agree with the communists on that that procreation ought to be happening outside the boundaries of family no it makes you poorer life shorter more crime uh naturally more more uh conducive to divorce mm -hmm. uh worse for the kids kids start watching porn earlier all sorts of deep stats on what happens when people try to play house husband and wife from outside a true Christian marriage. Conversely, true Christian marriage, we already said this is my procreative system, it procreates, my digestive system digests, pretty straightforward argument. Now we're just proving the element that it's better to do procreative, to let my procreative system reign from within marriage and the, the sociological st statistics and another natural law, it, it makes sense. You know, family is good unless you're a communist. This covers that. Mm -hmm. This covers that, that last prong. It's better to let your body do, go, go to the science, let your body do what it was built to do. Any of your system, your endocrinological systems, let it be properly teleologically endocrinological. Your digestive system, same. Reproductive system, same. Why, for health gurus, when it comes to uh, cults like the World Economic Forum, the UN, WHO, they say, hey, trust the science on all your bodily system of organs, right. aside from procreative system. Because I'm sorry, my friend out there, I, I want you to be liberated from this the same way my, my two brothers here do and EMJ does. But you are the victim of a brainwash, a psyop, like all, not just all save one of the human systems of organs should be encouraged under good health, Christian health, to operate at full potential. And that can only happen within the, the guys uh, within the, the boundaries, rather, of Christian matrimony. Yeah, right. You've got three levels, haven't you? You've got unmarried sex, which we all know from the sexual revolution has created social chaos exactly as it was planned to because children need married parents. All metrics are worse for kids of 
unmarried parents. We can go up a level to multiple wives, like in Islam. Although even then, I think like 90%, 96% even of Muslim marriages are actually monogamous. It's only a very small number of guys who have multiple wives. But multiple wives is better than just straight out unmarried sex, fornication, because at least the kids know who the father is, right? That's right. important. They all know who their dad is. This isn't just some kind of free for all orgy that some of the socialists planned where nobody really knows who their parents are. That's disastrous. But the point is that monogamous societies have been the most successful because human beings flourish best under monogamy because we are monogamous by nature, meaning it's what best suits our rational nature. And you can see proof of that just in terms of secular studies in biology too. multiple wives actually suppresses female fertility. So this idea that women just love being in a harem with one elite guy who's managed to hoard them all. No, their fertility gets suppressed. This is why monogamous societies outbreed non-monogamous ones. Monogamy works best for men, for women, and for children. So that's the argument for it. And you can see it in scripture too. How many wives does God make Adam? One. How many people does Christ say that marriage involves? Two, becoming one flesh. So we've got monogamy there. All right, some of the Old Testament patriarchs have multiple wives, but that represents a falling away from marriage as God instituted it due to original sin. And then when Christ comes, he corrects that. Amen. Uh, and I think that's a more than satisfactory answer from both of my guests. It's very logical. It makes perfect sense, at least to me. And I think anybody who's got some brain, I want to add this uh, super chat. Thank you, Sam Fisher from Canada. Uh, he says, yo, Elliot, your interview with Mark Quipet, which was all about porn, uh, was a game changer for me. Uh, Mark's doing great work in terms of, you know, spreading this message. He's also a Catholic man and he's uh, suffered with porn use. And I was helping men overcome it, by the way. Uh, currently on day 38 of semen retention slash no fat. It's taken me 10 years of trial and error, but I feel like I'm finally starting to crack this. You know, I'm curious what your guys' thoughts are on uh, this I don't know how else you describe it, but as a movement where men are uh, are practicing semen retention, uh, this it started with the no fat movement. Um, is this a good thing? Or does it lead to other problems? Uh, what are your takes on that, fellas? Good masturbation is degenerate. It's contrary to natural law. It weakens men. It has all the dangerous effects that porn does in terms of dulling the intellect and weakening the will through lust. So if guys are using these no fat programs to get control of themselves again, that's only going to help them get control of their lives overall and especially their spiritual lives. So I'm all for it. Of course I am too. I, I want to redefine pornography. Pornography is just recontextualizing something good and beautiful and true, particularly the, the product of an appetite that's good, beautiful and true, in a, in a improper context. That's all pornography is. You can pornographize anything. Mm. You take something good, take it out of its con, you strip it out of its context, no pun intended, and it actually becomes bad. It, it's not just true with sex, right? This is uh, the concept of fetishizing something. It's pornographizing it. And porn is the best known version of pornographizing something. But when, when, we, when we differentiate in like a hard conceptual way between pornography and masturbation, this is, this is wild because men who, uh, it's, it's gross to talk in this much detail, but men who masturbate without use of pornography are just using the so-called spank bank, right? They're just going to their, they're going to their uh, platonic forms of past pornographic images or past sexual images mm. they've seen. They're going to their, their phantasms, right? Their reproduced images in their intellect uh, to, to make this even nerdier. So you're still pornographizing images you've seen in the past. These are just uh, right. the product of your phantasms, which are still pornographic. Uh, in the case of I'm not using porn, it's all the same. It's all the same shit. And 
the point is our Lord and nature together want us to have sex if we're not, uh, you know, clerics, if we're lay people, but have it in the proper context. The proper context is natural, better. You're not de theologizing it, taking away its teleology, and it's better. So you're supposed to have sex. You're just supposed to have sex with your wife where it's open to life. It's, it's that simple. Masturbation is porn. Porn is masturbation. And yes, of course it's horrible. And like Will says, it's degenerate. It's for, and it's not for anyone because it's inherently disordered. So I was going to say, oh, it's for horny preteens. It's, it's not for them either. I'm going to try to make it where I'm going to give my boy, my preteen boy, when he's that old, pep talks on it beforehand. Hopefully he never goes through this, never gets enslaved the same way all these guys out there did to pornography masturbation. But if it's for anyone, it's for degenerate preteens. And uh, the fact that there are grown men out there having to challenge themselves with no fap is uh, well, if you if you have to challenge yourself, then so be it. It's a good challenge, but it's 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 a pathetic statement on our society. Well, along the same lines, we have um, Adam Pash here. It says he practiced semen retention, so he thought it was a good idea. He agrees with what we're saying for years, but his experience is that it's it's been a, extremely unhealthy to not ejaculate. Uh, he says our body is designed to do it by holding your urine or poop for long periods of time. Uh, tell me how that goes. Uh, I'll take a quick stab at it. Uh, in terms of likening it onto urine and poop, uh, unless you're sticking enemas up your butt every day to make the poop come, uh, that's just your body doing what it naturally does. Uh, there's another question here, and, and I guess we could kind of combine these, but I'll address it. I didn't. Let me see if I could bring two up at the same time. Uh, someone also asks, you know, about wet dreams. Uh, so I can't have them both there. Let me bring this back up. My, my answer to sort of both of them is that if it's going to come out, it'll come out. Just like when you got to poop. If it's going to come, it's going to come. Uh, you don't have to help it. You don't have to stroke yourself to get the pee to come out, right? It's, it's, a little, it's much different. It's passive. You know, your body releases what it needs to release. And I'm not sure. I, I would love to hear my guest uh, speak on this as well. Is that something to be ashamed of? You know, I had a wet dream. Like, should I go to confession? So anyway, uh, just I'll open it up kind of broad. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on the fact that it, or the idea that it might not be healthy? And then what do we do if it just comes out while I'm sleeping? No, it's not shameful. Well, it's not shameful uh, because it happens naturally. The body regulates itself. And by the way, if you have to stroke yourself to pee uh, and your pee is white, then you're not peeing. <laughs> so that's go ahead well sorry <laughs> yeah i was gonna say the uh the point about the wet dreams you, you're not sinning because that's involuntary you're just dealing with something that's like a reflex action almost so you don't need to go to confession for that it's not something that you've done knowingly and willfully so it's totally different the idea that people must ejaculate a certain amount of times per week or per month or whatever to be healthy. That's an old myth that's been put around for a long time by people who are opposed to chastity in general, celibacy in particular, that's somehow unhealthy. But you've got the very long-lived priests who haven't got problems with various kinds of cancers of the reproductive organs showing you that it's perfectly possible to live a celibate life be healthy and live a long time so this is just another cope really but to come back to my first point yeah you have a really strong sex drive because god wants pretty much all men to get married and have kids be fruitful and multiply this is actually a command very few people are called to celibacy and the people who are god is going to help them with that because that's a tough challenge thank you uh out, think outside the container was gracious enough to send us five bucks for answering the question about chastity for men. Uh, he says, thank you for answering the question. And uh, I don't agree with you guys. Of course, that's what he's saying, but he appreciates it, appreciates the discussion, which is cool. And so I appreciate that also having a open and honest conversation amongst fellas about what's most important. Also a super chat here from Bruce Wayne. 
Tim looking more like V from Vendetta by the day. <laughs> I've noticed that too, man. You're looking tougher and tougher every time we get together. Uh, he <laughs> says, ideas are bulletproof. Dominus vis boviscum et cum spiritu tu. He's speaking Latin. What does that mean, uh, Tim? Uh, with, with your spirit. Uh, peace be with you and, and with your spirit. Yeah. Thank you. Amazing. Yeah, I'm a fluctuator. I'm a fluctuator because yeah. I, I have a bad lower back, right? I was always... I was a basketball player, but I was always built a little stronger when I'd work out than a typical basketball player. And I all throughout my 30s, I would go back to lifting, hurt my lower back, have to quit for six or, or 12 months. So I, I got back on it a couple months ago. So I'm I, I, upper body anyway, I, I, I beef up pretty quick. Lower body's different because I can never go that hard, uh, which is what I talk to these guys about behind the scenes. But uh, yeah, doing my best. So Will asserted something uh, just a minute ago, and we've got a question here or a uh, assertion as well that agrees. Why is it, do you guys agree that you can't quit porn without Christ? Uh, why would somebody say that? Um, well, the Baltimore Catechism says that we can't beat the devil by ourselves because He's a lot smarter than we are. He's watched the whole of human history and knows human nature better than we do and what all our weaknesses are and how to tempt us. He can't force us to do things, but he can work on our imagination. And to defeat an enemy like that, you don't go into battle by yourself. And more broadly speaking, we can't keep the natural law without God's help. This is just a point about fallen human nature. So why would we be surprised that one of the most powerful, perhaps the most powerful drives in human life is one of the hardest areas for fallen man to take charge of and keep control of. So this is why we need grace to be able to get that rightly ordered. This is said that lust is the thing that snares most souls. So most people are in hell because of lust it's not the worst thing you can do there are worse sins but it's the one that catches the most people it's the devil's broadest fishing net if you like thank you tim thoughts uh d do we need christ to overcome this sin well it's uh, th there's this is a tricky question because you have the natural law and you have the eternal law and, mm -hmm. and both speak together. So precise, I, I won't, I won't say hard need. I would say soft need. And here mm -hmm. is why I enumerated natural law, natural reason, reasons why it's bad to engage in sexual activity of any kind outside of marital coitus. I made that appeal like five minutes ago, right? Mm -hmm. That means that countervailing upon this natural appeal are natural reasons why not to not do it. So there has to be a natural law case. And if there is, then it appeals to even non-Christians. You get the graces of Christian marriage in a unique context, the unique context of the Roman catechism I was citing here. The graces are what make it easy to do. When I was young in my marriage, it was much harder to, for one thing, first first couple of years, I've said this publicly, uh, we, we, we contracepted, you know, we, we were not uh, good Catholics. I was, you know, basically in a five to seven year road of returning to the church, my first five to seven years of, of marriage. So not only was I not getting the graces of the marital act, but I wasn't getting the other graces of, of living completely um, in, in uh, concomitance with the other demands of the faith. Um, but that being said, if you do it the right way, you get extra graces, which make it easier. I mean, palpably make it easier. Will and Elliot, you'll, you'll attest to this. When you're living in the faith, it's like, well, this is just way easier. I'm receiving the Eucharist. Um, I'm, I'm going to confession regularly. I'm avoiding entanglements with mortal sin. Most, most of my confessions are just confessing venials. I'm not running into the sexual slavery errors that 99% of men out there are. I'm confessing more detailed, more nuanced, non-sexual stuff at my confessions most of the time. 
and it just makes you stronger, uh, lighter, you know, like same as once, once you get a weightlifting program and it's working for you, it's like, oh, this is going, I'm, I'm getting faster. I'm able to jump higher. So yes, you need the graces of, of, of Jesus to do anything and to do it well, particularly in the moral life. But no, you don't need the graces of being a Christian, specifically a sacramental Christian, in order to see why you should stop fapping or whatever. Yeah, I, I also think a point that Tim's made in previous episodes that if you've got an atheist alcoholic on an Alcoholics Anonymous program and he completes that and he beats his alcoholism, even though he doesn't know it, God has been helping him to achieve that. I think that probably applies to porn as well. However, I think there are some porn addictions where you've got roots that have gone so deep into a person and their willpower has been weakened so badly, their intellect has been darkened so badly that some of these secular courses aren't enough. And that's why so many guys don't get the results, why they do relapse. And at that point, you need the heavy artillery of the sacraments. You need confession. You might need something like 33-day consecration to St. Joseph as well. I know guys who tried that and got more relief than from anything else they've tried before with all the secular approaches because there's a demonic aspect to porn and spiritual warfare that you need to meet head on with spiritual weapons on the counterattack. Awesome. Thank you. Got a couple uh, super chats are coming in big time today. I appreciate it, fellas. Uh, also, a couple, uh, a couple of, um, I guess you could say, testimonials. We got one here from T CTN Music. He says, eight months of semen retention. I used to struggle in sleep and have a lot of wet dreams. I don't anymore. Now it's all good. No more wet dreams. I sleep like a baby. I'm not stressed. I feel great. Thanks to God. So it can happen. I know a lot of guys, you're, you're listening and you're like, oh, this is impossible. This is crazy. How could I ever actually do it? Well, there you go. You have some proof right there. See, his body's regulating itself. It's not just like the the uh, buildup of urine, uh, pee pee poo poo. It's not like that. Your body regulates itself <laughs> as to your desire. Right. It's not pee pee poo poo, man. Very cool. Uh, oh, we had another one. I lost it though. But super chat from Sam Fisher, kind of along the same lines. I was unable to quit corn by focusing on spirituality alone or science alone. He says, it wasn't until I focused, uh, I fused neuroscience with faith and prayer that I was able to break through, which, you know, this brings up a sort of an alternative uh, conversation, maybe for another day, but, you know, the church is not against science. Uh, science explains God's creation. It's when it turns into scientism where the science becomes our religion in essence. And so it's, uh, it's amazing. It's great. What are your guys' thoughts on that? You know, he's fusing what we've learned. Uh, if, there's a very powerful video on YouTube called Your Brain on Porn. And the, Dr. Huberman is doing a lot of great work in terms of what's happening to the dopamine receptors and, and the brain, the physiology as it relates to porn. We're talking from the spiritual aspect, but these scientists are doing an amazing job in terms of showing the real physiological detrimental effects of porn. Anything to add on that, fellas? That's an expression of the fact that we alone are rational animals. We can understand these things using our intellects. And it's great because it gives us the knowledge to be able to combat them more effectively. The scientists who are researching this are giving people who want to quit more ammo to be able to do so. And we've got God's grace working alongside that as well. When you're thinking about neuroplasticity and why porn has the effects that it does, you're just studying, I suppose, what in the, the Aristotelian four causes would be the, the efficient causality of it, right, Tim? Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Friction. Yep. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, super conservative, uh, social conservative sends us a $20 super chat. Thank you, brother. He says, for single men, this is a really good one, um, you know, because we got a lot of single guys here. And then we got one for married men here in a moment that I want to bring up. Tough one for me, um, but my guess, I think, will have a really good answer for you. But Social Conservative asks, for single men looking to marry, how long should one be free from porn before marrying? And for men who still struggle, 
how do we reconcile the need to be absent from porn for a set time? And so he quotes uh, Corinthians 7, 9, which I don't know what that is. I'll go look it up while you guys take a stab at that. Well, I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a drying out period the way alcoholics have before you begin courting a woman. But I, I think this depends on the individual. But a six to 12 month period of dating a woman is all it requires to ascertain the info. It's an informational time period dating. Before you get married, you should date only six to 12 months before being married, before your wedding day. And uh, anything else is cucked. And uh, this period by itself, I think is sufficient. I don't know what, what Will thinks, but it might be nice if you're today's day one of uh, no workplace accidents being porn. You might not be bad to dry out for three months before you try to date a girl, but I don't think it's necessary. I think if you have a chaste courtship for six to 12 months before marriage, you can, you can build that continence, sexual continence muscle big enough. Uh, it's a prudential question, though. What do you think, Will? Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. I don't think there's an official uh, church ruling on this that we can refer to, but if you've got six to 12 month courtship, you've got engagement and you're staying chased for that and you've kicked your porn habit, this is only going to help your mental clarity and acuity. So you're making better decisions going into the marriage. I think too many guys make the mistake of either using porn or fornicating or masturbating, whatever it might be at that period when they're making a very important decision for the rest yeah. of their lives. And you want to have all your wits about you because what I've seen happen to so many men is that basically they're not thinking straight. They're mm -hmm. thinking with their dicks instead. And then they end up with a woman who isn't really the right one for getting married to. And they should have stayed in control, but they failed to. Yeah. And I echo that sentiment, that sentiment all the time, guys. You got on sex goggles. You don't know this woman because you're busy blowing your load with her. Uh, the best way to know, you know, one of the gr great questions that come in all the time is, how do I know if this is the right woman for me? Stop having sex with her. <laughs> You'll start to learn very quickly whether or not it's just the pleasure or it's the woman herself. Thank you, guys. Yeah. yeah. You got to make that decision while not pussy whipped. Right. So this one, uh, like I said, so he's asking, Wolfgang, Elliot, when do you stop procreating according to the Catholic Church? And, uh, and are you practicing that? So he's asking me personally, if it's not too personal. So, you know, yeah, I'll answer it. Uh, according to the Catholic Church, I'll let the guys handle it. But um, I'm not procreating. You know, I stopped having children at four. Uh, I'm not necessarily proud of the fact that in 2013, after my fourth child, I sterilized myself. I mean, I, I wasn't a Catholic at the time. I didn't know any better. It, I thought it was normal. You know, I was brainwashed by the culture just like everyone else. Uh, and I thought, you know, sex and marriage was, of course, it should be, could be uh, separate from procreation. And I thought, I didn't think twice about it, I, you know. And so I repented. I've gone to uh, confession. And I've repositioned my whole idea my, my the way I approach sex in my marriage as a result I'm always much more cautious in reminding myself if I was actually living naturally would I pursue my wife right now and so it's caused me just out of self-control to have a bit more discernment about when I approach my wife and also it's also taught me a lot of control in sex and I don't know if this maybe I, maybe the guys can uh, speak about this also too, but I, I'm curious about their answers. Um, I've began practicing semen retention in marriage by withholding, blowing my load when I have sex. And if you learn how to, it's just a matter of learning how to control your body while you're having sex, I'll have sex with my wife without blowing my load. And I do that sort of as a, a reparations sometimes. I'm like, I'm not going to let myself indulge. I'm, in, I'm engaging with my wife, but I'm going to refrain. And so just being personal, letting you know, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm open and honest about it, not proud about it, 
But I'm curious what both of my guests think, because uh, they're both married Catholic men, have been practicing since the beginning, have lots of children. I mean, you guys are, uh, Will just had a uh, number seven, is it, Will? Mm, yep, seven two days ago. So I'm, I'm drawing <laughs> with Tim now after he put the gauntlet down about a year ago. Seven all. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I hear that and I'm like, man, I wish I was still a fertile man. Like seven is amazing. So congratulations. I forgot to congratulate you on that. So what are your guys thoughts? I think it's a really good question, you know, and not one that I will ever have the experience of. So when do you call it quits in terms of procreating and how do you go about that within the, uh, you know, the confines of the church's teachings? Maybe I'm doing it wrong too, you know, with a uh, semen retention. <laughs> You have to have what are called like serious and grave reasons to use NFP, which is natural family planning. Mm. And it's not contraception because there's no conception possible during the infertile period of the woman's cycle. And most guys haven't been taught, most girls haven't been taught in school because they don't want you knowing this that a woman is fertile for around six to seven days of every month. And if you have got some really good reason, best discussed with a priest, why you can't have more children, then you're gonna be avoiding those six days during the month, but having sex for the unitive purpose of it. So bonding the two of you for the benefit of the marriage and the children during the rest of the month. Those grave and serious reasons though are actually pretty rare. And in my case, for example, when people ask me, are you gonna stop at seven? My answer is a frustrating one for them, which is like, well, I don't know. Um, maybe God will send some more kids my way. I'm open to it. And I've got no reason to try to shut out more life from my marriage so maybe i'll get up to 10 kids 11 kids 12 <laughs> my wife's grandmother had 13 so the Man. point is in principle you're open to it and deciding that you've finished um isn't something you should do by yourself you should talk about it with the priest so that's my main bit of advice for that for you elliot i'm sorry to hear about the vasectomy um i don't think Bearing in mind, you didn't know what you were doing at the time. That's something that you should beat yourself up about because for mortal sin, you have to go into it with full knowledge and full understanding and commitment. So this is like with myself as well, looking back on mistakes that I made when I was a young man and didn't fully understand what I was doing. You can beat yourself up about it all day, or you can just accept that you knew what you knew at the time and you know more now and just try to help as many people know the full truth as possible. So guys listening to this, what Elliot said about the vasectomy, don't do it. And what you were saying there about uh, holding back and uh, not actually blowing your load with your wife, I wouldn't do that um, because I haven't had a vasectomy. So I would regard like um, pulling out, for example, coitus interruptus, that's not okay. You, you need to actually go through with the act all the way because there's like no real difference between uh, pulling out and then homosexuality on a deep level because you're trying to actually just avoid what the natural telos, as Tim put it, the natural end of sex is, which is children. And guys who do that, this is a form of cowardice in that because you're still after that pleasure without the responsibility because a big family places big demands on a guy. And it's funny to me how so many people will say like, men do hard things, bro. We have to man up and do stuff, but we don't wanna have too many kids because then that might be really hard. We might have to earn too much money. I might have to work too much. I'm gonna stop at one or two. No, the doing hard things and taking on the load, the responsibility, that applies most of all to running a family and being open to more children. Mm. Thank you. Oh, none of this applies to Elliot because of the the you know the change in status that he 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 uh, mentioned. Um, but yeah, I think I think technically, will Onanism pulling out 
uh, refers to uh, pulling out and then ejaculating someplace else. So uh, there's what people should know is even within the Roman Catholic Church where everything's codified, there's a little bit of a debate. You know, I, I follow Edward Fazer and um, I think the natural law argument, which is that uh, what's come to be called NFP, which means you don't have procreative unitive sex on one of those six or seven fertile days of the wife. I, uh, the natural law view, the church's old view of it has a more expansive, uh, a more lenient view, which is just, hey, as long as you avoid that on one of those six or seven days, um, they, it's basically impossible to, to run into sin if the man doesn't ejaculate. Um, that's, that's the more lenient view. Some of the hardcore trads following, uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori take a ridiculous view, which is like every single act, um, constitutive action, like kissing your wife. Okay. This has to be one and the same with the procreative unitive act. So there has to be like an ejaculation for that act. Kissing your wife is part of sex. Uh, like the other you know the other natural parts second base third third base things like that those are individual acts each of those d uh, requires one ejaculation it gets absurd fast there are um my, what i'd call minority jurisdiction saints uh that have said things that are really stringent Al alphonsus Liguori is one of them uh the natural law argument the thomistic argument most thomists follow no, uh, a more permissive view. The church has not officially ruled on this. What counts as an individual sex act, like if a man's at second base with his wife, does this require a separate uh, uh, completion, active ejaculation? Uh, I think I think the smart answer is no. Such that you know, if it is a fertile day. Um, and uh, a man is kissing his wife and maybe helps her out. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, it gets really dodgy with penetration with a pull out that, that I, I think, I think that might actually transgress the boundaries uh, where you're deteologizing the act. But if there are other things you can do, you're allowed to do that would be considered foreplay let's say it's the seventh fertile day and in 12 hours you you two have ascertained she's no longer going to be fertile well yeah you could you could always count that as a foreplay to an eventual completion of the act uh 12 hours later so there there are ways to get clever where you're using i mean i'm also a lawyer uh where you get the you're, you're honoring the letter of the law and there are no ejaculations outside of you know the, the the ordained spot but um yeah so it's it's a wider question and and trad catholics like debate about this online but the general principle is that which is not specifically proscribed is permitted and the, as everyone out there knows even if you're not catholic the catholic church has already proscribed like everything you know like it's right. very specific we have a very specific yeah. faith so this is one that i believe is intentionally left open for husbands and wives to figure out not the contraception issue you can never contracept right. a man can never blow his load outside but uh there's some there's some technical details where if you get clever you are observing the letter of the law and and sometimes the nfp debate is uh can be really provincial and and, and there are some some uh i don't know school marms out there and usually they're male school marms who are catholic trads that are like no you have to put a bag over your wife's head and you're not allowed to even kiss her during sex. It's about procreative and unity. <laughs> and they're, they're just no fun. They're no I, fun. I really you, do. You, go ahead, Will. Go ahead. Uh, I, I was going to say, uh, I like winding <laughs> these people up because pre-Vatican II, if you look at what most of the traditional moral, moral theologians say, the church hasn't ruled on it officially, but most of the old manuals, they will say oh, that oral sex is fine as foreplay. And that will make yeah. people shriek and howl, saying, no, how can it be? It's contrary to natural law. But it's not, because what you're doing is stimulating the sexual organs for the purpose of readying them for the sexual act itself. So you're actually like enhancing it. You're working with natural law. Hmm. So you can go back to those old manuals, pre-Vatican II, 
these guys are all saying that four play is fine, including oral sex. And the people who just want to mock the Catholic view on sex is saying like, they're not allowed to do anything like Tim's saying, you can't even kiss and there's no foreplay involved. <laughs> That's just wrong. Hmm. Yeah. There's a guy called Ron Conti. He's a boomer, very Vatican II, that we all associate Vatican II, like Will's correctly characterizing, as liberalizing everything in the church. Right. Well, Ron Conti pretty much popularized no oral sex, particularly on the women. And it's like, no, the sexual act, procreative unitive, is defined by a man spilling his seed. So with women, multiple orgasms is fine. Uh, uh, Oral sex, male, male on women, is not even problematic, right? It doesn't even involve retention. If a, a woman does that, if a, a wife does that to her husband, he has to retain. Uh, a woman does not have to prevent herself from having an orgasm during male on female oral sex. Uh, according to the manualist tradition, the manualist yeah. tradition <laughs> is the closest thing. It's the Thomistic manuals from the early 20th century. This is who I was referring to. This is where Phaser gets all this stuff. It's it's quite permissive. Um, and I, w w the last thing we need are nerds at 2.59 before the bell rings on a Friday reminding the teacher to give us more homework, right? I hated those kids. Those kids <laughs> need to get beat up, uh, it, proverbially wow. speaking. Prover okay. no, no one go beat up Ron Conti. But Man, if it, it wasn't, if, if it wasn't as... Uh, confusing as it was before we've definitely gotten into the weeds so now I it sparks questions yeah. for me like okay so oral sex is okay uh, a woman on a man as long as he doesn't blow his load yeah correct so that's what I was saying earlier like in the let's say there's a guy who every time his wife is fertile he decides um I'm just gonna go for oral sex and then ejaculate in her mouth well that is Sorry to be crude, but that is him deliberately avoiding what Tim called the telos of the sexual act. So he's shutting the marriage off from life and right. God's not going to be happy with him for doing that. If you month on month on month, you just decide, yeah, I'm in that fertile window. I'm just not going to give the sexual act a chance to actually reach its proper fulfillment. That's wrong. Okay. So let me it's ask this. It's not procreative. It's right. not procreative. Yeah. So it fails it. Yep. from you know tim from your lawyer's point of view right like because getting into the weeds is tough if we don't have firm rules and laws um, and maybe this is a gray area too so if that's allowed then how is that different than having sex just not coming to a clim climax or not ejaculating as a man because that's kind of yeah i don't know that's what i had been practicing and thinking that Maybe this is okay, and I'm almost getting ready to promote it as an idea, but I want to slow down and make sure I'm not causing anybody to sin, but to, you know, have intercourse, but ret retain in intercourse. In other words, get to the point where it's like, okay, uh, we're done here now. You know, I'm breathing through it. I'm holding myself back, and is, we've enjoyed right. this intimacy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not blowing yeah. my load, and then we come yeah. out and then go about the rest of our day. How is that, how is that different? One. Here's why I'm unsure, Elliot. Yeah. Um, I'm, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure yeah. it's wrong because you know, trads out there, you know, if they're from my channel, would be uh, wailing uh, you know, as against the wailing wall. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure. It might be. It is very close. It's a very close case. When, when Will, yeah, I think Will and I were both like, I'm not sure if that's all. So yeah, a man, a man can enjoy this privilege as a, as a creature of foreplay. Yeah, you know, oral sex from his wife as they're getting ready to, uh, you know, get get unitive and procreative, which means the meeting of the male sex part with the female sex part. So it's it's OK mm -hmm. because it's foreplay, which mm -hmm. the Thomistic manuals, um, I, I think univocally up until around Vatican II, Ron Conti all say, yeah, this is good. And it's never been ruled on adversely by the church, which is the general principle. The Jesuits love this anyway. What's not prescribed is permitted, um, which is really true, though. It's not just Jesuitical. <laughs> gotcha. but, but once you have the union of the two sexual organs, uh, then you can no longer qualify it as foreplay, mm. right? Now it's, it's go time, right? So one, <laughs> that's, that's the only reason, even though... 
the mouth, you know, it is getting gross. I don't, I don't usually talk so specifically publicly, but even though the mouth is acting like a female reproductive organ, right. uh, in the case of oral sex, it's not, it's still foreplay, which has always been, always been allowed. Um, yeah. Up until Vatican II. Uh, there's yeah. there's people, so I, I, people in the chat like losing their minds here saying it's getting so complicated, it's so complicated. <laughs> it's really not. So okay, contraception not. is always wrong. Contraception is always wrong. And the point we're making here about foreplay is that ejaculating outside the vagina willfully is also wrong as well. Yeah, yeah. but that's why I'm not sure. All The only thing that's complicated, not, none of this is complicated. I'm... I'm very confident I've told many, many trads, if it's you and your wife and it's foreplay, you don't have to put a bag over her head. You, do, you, you may enjoy oral sex. Uh, some of the manualists even say elements which would insinuate anal, but I, th that, one, that one people usually draw the line. And I, yeah. I, I think, I think for, for human health reasons, I think, yeah, draw, draw the line there. But some of what they say about the permissiveness of oral sex would apply to anal sex. As long as you are ejaculating at the end during the actual act when it's no longer pre-sex, when it's actual proper sex, then, then it's go time you have to ejaculate. But I'm not sure if it counts as onanism, the sin of Onan, uh, who, was, who pulled out on his wife. I, judging with my lawyer's minds on the L here are the three elements of a crime. Here's the three elements of the tort of negligence, right? Duty, breach, causation, damages. You have to check off each of those elements. I don't see how it's a sin using the traditional elemental Catholic analysis, Elliot, what you're doing. I don't see it, it as onanism because you're not later ejaculating. Um, you're, you're being continent. The only way it would be a sin is if you have the procreative unitive act without the completion. So I, I, that, might, that, that would be the way it gets you. But that's the only thing that's confusing about this. Foreplay is always fine as long as it culminates non-contraceptively. And like, like Will yep. said, nowadays, trads have overreacted in a weird way. They're on the opposite side of Vatican II um, with regard to uh, guys that aren't particularly conservative Catholics like Ron Conti that have been the... Uh, the school marms. So it's, it's a weird situation, but, but foreplay is fine as long as it um, culminates with uh, a man uh, procreatively ejaculating in the proper place. And you think about it, yeah. you're not trying to get away with anything. You're just enhancing the act with, with foreplay. Yeah, exactly. And the, the point I was making is that I don't think it's permitted, as we've said, to, to pull out and then ejaculate elsewhere. That's the main thing. I'll tell you what does make it really complicated is that Elliot's had a vasectomy. That's a complicating factor for sure. You could get that reversed, I think, but we probably, <laughs> probably, yeah, not, not discuss, not everyone can, I guess, but yeah, that does complicate the moral analysis, but I, I want people yeah. out there to understand it's, it's not complex. Otherwise, no, even the no. fuddy duddy Roman Catholic church in its Thomas Aquinas manualist tradition, which is the early 20th century, uh, the closest thing to the magisterium weighing in on this is all's, all's fine in love as long as you are, um, you know, as long as it's procreative and unitive at the end. And uh, e each marital act culminates with that. That's what I think gets you, Elliot, on that. It's got to culminate with a procreative unitive act. Mm -hmm. Okay. Appreciate it. Yeah, that was, a, that was a great conversation. I love you guys' input. So I want to respect you guys' time. Uh, we're getting close here. I also want to just acknowledge two more super chats. You guys willing to stick around for two super chats? Let's do sure. it. Okay, cool. We got uh, outside the container once again. Twenty bucks. Thank you, brother. Uh, he, he, his th he wants to know thoughts on woman's pornographic addiction to dating apps. He says where they swipe right only on the top five percent of men. Where does accountability for women's animal impulse come in? And please don't say hypergamy is for kids. What are you guys' thoughts? I'm not totally clear on the question, but if you guys have anything to add. Uh, hidden in that, is he angry about something? The women are going to try and get the men with the most resources they possibly can. I presume that top 5% line is about that. 
So which guy looks like he's going to be the best provider for a family, for example. And he doesn't like the idea that hypergamy, which means that women will tend to go for the the best man they can possibly get because that's what means the most resources for the family. He doesn't accept that as an answer. Um, you're not going to be able to force these women to go for lower quality men than they can get because they want to do what's best for the kids in terms of more resources. But... This bit about pornographic addiction and animal impulses, my thoughts on it are that women have fallen just like men are and they struggle with lust and the devil works on them just like he works on men too. So yeah, there are women with porn problems and we shouldn't be surprised to see that. I've seen some stats showing that there are some kinds of porn that seem to hit women even harder than they hit men. Well, I think still overall men struggle with it more but I'm not surprised by any of this, nor should any Christian be. This is just original sin playing itself out for women as it plays itself out for men too, in an area, sex, where everyone struggles. Amen. Will, Will and I were discussing this in uh, off channel and uh, we, uh, it's a rare disagreement. I, I see those women struggle with porn as well. Statistics, and I always think that's a psyop. I always think that's, um, and maybe a counterintuitive feminist trope because they're, they've tried to sell the bill of goods that uh, women are, are really wired like men sexually. We're really not. I, right. I, I find it really difficult to believe that women who talk to any woman, they are not, obs they are not obsessed with looks the way men are. They are not even moderately <laughs> obsessed with looks the way men are. And they are not wired to their sexual ergon um as based on through the eyes right uh, i mean it's, it's been said a man's eyes get him in trouble a woman's mouth gets her in trouble um women we do not struggle with visual lusting the way we do and i i only see pornography as corresponding to visual lusting which makes it uh, hard to believe i i don't know uh before i was married i knew a lot of a lot of women. I didn't know any that that uh, would own up to a porn addiction. I don't know any women that this has come up like Steph did a woman's form. I don't see it as a legitimate problem. Women have the legitimate problem of nagging their husbands, maybe lusting in some interior way. Maybe materialism is it. I, I have a really, really hard time believing the stats on that. But as always, Will, Will brings the receipts. He brings the stats, which I respect. I just I don't know if women are fudging to make this up, Cosmo magazine admitted uh, in the 70s that a bunch of its its uh, stories were just made up to make right. women more sexual. I think the statistic could be like that. Uh, Betty Friedan mm -hmm. fudging sex story when women are not. I think this is as someone call EMJ. I think this is a function of Hollywood being run by pornographers who, uh, you know, libido dominandi uh, who are male writers that are writing females saying male things like um, there's a line Megan Fox uses in Transformers one where she's like, Oh, just big arms and washboard abs like that. That's what a gay man would say because <laughs> men are male and they're visual. <laughs> right. That's not what women say. Women yeah. are like, Oh, he's so protective. He's so, he's so manly he prevailed under these circumstances he stood up to the crowd that that really gets them going not big arms and washboard abs that's a gay man's thing <laughs> well said well said <laughs> cool last one so uh sort of off base a little bit here but i appreciate the super chat from d's the kings uh he says how do you guys feel about living with a woman to see what it's like living with her before marriage, should you know what it's like living together before you get married? No, don't do it. Well, cohabitation is one of the things that massively increases the likelihood of divorce, and cohabitation is going to go hand in hand with fornication most of the time. And Father Ripperker has a really interesting section on this in his book on mental health. And he says that putting two people together in close quarters like that without God's grace, 
to be able to help them deal with each other's failings and overcome the effects of original sin is a really dangerous situation for them to be in. So marriage is not just a natural institution or a civic institution, it's also a sacrament. Tim's talked about how we're given the grace to be able to um, live with and overcome the various challenges and responsibilities of that role. Cohabitation is you trying to do it as a fallen man with a fallen woman, just the two of you off your own power, and that's a really dangerous situation to put yourself into. So not a smart thing to do and traditionally looked at as worse than fornication because cohabitation is basically saying two fingers up to the social mores and the standards and I'm just basically a long-term fornicator. I'm making a point out of sticking to it and that's why it used to be shamed quite heavily and the fact that we don't shame it anymore has come with consequences for social instability and marital breakdown. So that's not something I would recommend you do, no. You wouldn't scuba without air, right? And uh, you, you'll die. Same thing. A man and a woman living together is actually an un, unnatural situation unless you've got the grace of marriage, the air. And uh, if, you live, if you shack up with a woman without the graces of holy matrimony, it will make you, it might be a really good pairing. It might be a good match pairing. Uh, by nature and by your temperaments, but it'll fuck everything up because you'll, you'll start thinking you hate each other. And th this happens to people. Uh, I've watched it happen to lots of my friends. Mo most of my friends actually for most of my life were out of the church. I've watched it happen to them and it, it fucks up what might otherwise be a good relationship. It's utterly not objective because you're trying to scuba dive without air. You're going to die even if you're a good pack. Very cool. I appreciate it. Hey, so to wrap up real quick, uh, Will is going to be joining me on my podcast next week. We're going to be talking about saving men from sexless marriages, how to how to handle that situation if you find yourself in it without traditional therapy or consideration of divorce. It has to do with dynamics between you and your wife, right, Will? That's it. Yep. We've all been told to go for equality, but we need more polarity in marriage. And this is basically about natural law and what the masculine role is and the feminine role we talked a lot about a few of the points we'll be discussing next week today already so if you've enjoyed this one come back for more detail then i'm looking forward to it yeah it's gonna be a great talk and tim what do you got going on now man and i know you're doing a lot of new projects all the time writing books what do you got going yeah for the first time in this will be the fifth year i, I published a book a year from 2019 through 2023 or 2020 through 2022 or something like that 2019 2020 2021 2022 i published a book this will be my first year not doing that but me and will have a project happening i've had lots of really good guests on rules for retrogrades my youtube channel lately i'm i'm looking looking forward to uh a summer of really really good podcasts on timothy gordon so and and, and doing more cmask with you boys Nice. Awesome, guys. Thanks for joining us here on my channel today. Appreciate all the questions and the super chats, fellas. Uh, we'll be back next month. We're rotating through our challenge channels. And uh, I think this was a good one. One for the books, guys. Thank you. God bless and have a great weekend, guys. You too, guys. Thanks.